If you want to support the channel so we can make more videos where people spam the comments by saying That movie sucked because nothing happened in it. Check out our Patreon at the link in the description below. Mark, you realise I'm bored. I'm dangerously bored. Every 10 years, Sight and Sound magazine corrals some of the most revered directors, scholars and cineasts in the world to deliberate over the greatest movies of all time. Now, typically, these lists are dominated by the kind of ubiquitous heavyweights you'd expect. Each one a rightfully beloved juggernaut clamouring for pole position. It came as quite a shock then that 2022's instalment was topped not by Renoir, Kubrick or Coppola, but by Chantal Ackerman's Jean Dielman 23 Commerce Key 1080 Brussels, a French-Belgian obscurity that few have heard of and even fewer have watched. At 201 minutes, it simmers on the transitional cusp between second and third wave feminism, boiling over into depression, repression and compulsion. It is also extremely boring. When Jean Dielman knits a sweater, we linger long enough to see her making tangible progress. When she peels these potatoes, there is no merciful editing. No difference between the fictional space of cinema and the drawn-out reality of kitchen counters and cutlery. I'm in awe of the respectful compositional discipline, but I in no way begrudge anyone who doesn't want to spend close to three and a half hours enduring it. That's the beautiful thing about engineered banality. It's stark, insufferable, and important. For all the clock watching, humming and hawing, the narrative use of boredom is unbelievably interesting. Hello? Arthur Schopenhauer called it a tame longing without any particular object. Tolstoy summed it up as a desire for desires. Twin Peaks fans tend to define it as any scene featuring James in season two. <coughs> for as universal an experience as it is, there is often a difficulty in articulating what we mean when we say something's boring. That's because, as German philosopher and ennui expert Martin Heidegger theorised, there are actually three distinct kinds of boredom. That's nice. One, the mundaneity of waiting. Two, the malaise of being alive. And three, the weariness of familiarity. Or, in more filmic terms, watching Rooney Mara silently gorging on a pie for seven minutes in A Ghost Story, the protracted pining of In the Mood for Love, and the franchise fatigue of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Are you thinking what I think you're thinking? I'm thinking it. What are we thinking? Thinking what? I'm thinking it too. How we each respond to these branches of boredom is as subjective as anything that requires interpretive engagement. In the same way a game of football leaves my brother on the edge of his seat and me fast asleep, Tastes and attention spans can and will enrich or ruin any viewing experience. So let's start off looking at those first two, the mundaneity of waiting and the malaise of being alive, and why these breeds of monotony are essential to appreciation and understanding. Zoologist Luis Villazon categorises boredom alongside loneliness or hunger. Evolutionarily speaking, the stimulatory respite of boredom is crucial not only for the development of consciousness, but for our ability to interrogate and comprehend our environment beyond what may be immediately apparent. Oh dear. 
Amidst the unwavering tedium of a grazing patch, an impala is only able to escape the jaws of a leopard by instinctually reacting to the slightest shift in sound or scenery. Now let's apply that same principle to the stalkers and elephants of the world. In these glacially paced stretches of supposed inaction, every fluttering variation becomes vital. Jean Dielman's subtle collapse is built not in broad strokes, but in watching someone's laborious routine slowly start to deviate and dissolve. The only reason the shuddering scare at the heart of The Exorcist 3 has stuck in the cultural consciousness for decades is because of the four minutes of inquisitivity coaxing nothingness that precedes it. These features are creating their own bubbles of time, spaces where things may not move at the same clip we're used to, but where stillness makes colour and movement meaningful, and quiet instills any sound with a commanding presence. The idea that such swallowing absence can serve as a catalyst for engagement doesn't just apply to film. For a musical example, take The Disintegration Loops by William Basinski an avant-garde ambient album in which a few seconds of frail magnetic tape are looped for upwards of an hour until the original physical sample has literally disintegrated under the strain. Here's the loop at minute one. And here it is again at minute 50. In instances where the payoff is both built into and predicated on the need to surrender to lingering ambience, the juice is in the squeeze. Whether you're viewing the work through a literalist or abstract lens, you can't expect to appreciate the endpoint if you forego the observational work and measured pace it takes to get there. By drawing attention to tedium, by forcing an audience to acknowledge the passage of time, the pain of those languishing moments is doing something quite remarkable on a cognitive and biological level. The drawling, minimalistic input being received by our eyes and ears triggers both the logical and creative hemispheres of the brain to light up at once. Think of it as complex, artistically abstract problem solving. What is this? As such, these minute, mumbling sequences leave lasting impressions, internalising information and, as a result, creating meaning and memories. Fritz, that's wonderful for you and me, but you think the, the public is going to understand that? Now, look what happens when you try to delete those moments of downtime. Like whenever a studio tries to fix a classic horror movie with a sped up, sanded down remake. When the reason the original works is at least in part because of their unhurried suspense and atmospheric vibes, Removing all that misty ambiguity and crawling dread is like trying to trim down the weight of an airplane by pushing out the pilot and cutting the wings off. That boring connective framework is why this soars, and this crashes and burns. That's because there's a big difference between using boredom as a narrative device 
and boredom as an unintentional byproduct. Here's an example. Martin Scorsese's The Irishman is a weighty deconstruction of the banality of evil and grinding apathy born of criminality. Listen to the dispassionate, half-awake way in which Frank Sheeran prepares to commit murder. You definitely don't want a silencer. You want to make a lot of noise to make the witnesses run away so they ain't going to be looking at you. But not the noise a 45 makes, because that makes too much noise, and a patrol car can hear it a few blocks away at least. It's ineffectual and dislocated, and that's the point. Now let's look at a matter of life and death that feels like being lulled to sleep outside a fireworks factory. It's trying so hard to inspire shock, awe and amazement, and yet it leaves my eyes rolling back to stare at my starving brain. <laughs> when the awesome becomes overdone and incalculable stakes become every day, contentment leads to complacency and unintended, meaningless boredom. That isn't to say there aren't bold and utterly brilliant examples of mile-a-minute entertainment, or that something can't be considered intellectual unless it's a languid lurch of an experience. <laughs> For one thing, I like cool set pieces as much as anyone because I'm not a pretentious dick. And secondly, as writer and film theorist Jeff Dyer perfectly puts it, we must never make the mistake of assuming that slowness is synonymous with profundity. The narcissism of small differences leads to the most boring conformity. Just because you put half the audience into a comatose stupor doesn't make you a cerebral work of artistic genius. Without notable characters, meaningful audiovisual composition, and some friction and flow to carry us along, Arthouse fodder can be just as vacuous and vexing as the most incoherent action. Which is my way of saying that Armageddon is smarter, more sincere, and invigorating than anything Lena Dunham has ever made. Because, again, slow doesn't mean smart, and fast doesn't mean fun. It's all relative to intent, execution, and the subjectivity of your audience. I'm more off-putting. No, I'm more off-putting. Kids, kids, you're both just awful. Now let's talk about Martin Heidegger's third and final form of boredom, the weariness of familiarity. Of the 100 highest earning films from each year of the 20th century, just 13% were franchise entries, sequels, or remakes. For the first 22 years of the 21st century, that figure is 100%, which makes a horrible kind of sense. Wow. Oh, Johnny, oh. Ah. Established IP has the safety blanket of pre-installed cultural awareness, and with the wider advent of digital communications technology, faster travel, and instantaneous access to everything all of the time, the public willingness to risk or delay gratification has demonstrably nosedived. Hence why the market has pivoted towards formulaic safety. And that's where the weariness of familiarity rears its ugly head. I am sitting in a room full of f***ing idiots. You dumb mother f***ers. You know what you did? To compensate for the inevitable been there done that yawn that's bound to set in once the same studio trots out the CGI decorated hero's journey yet again, the higher ups have cultivated a grab bag of tricks in an attempt to encourage or outright force viewer engagement. Q Grandpa Simpson rant. I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. It'll happen to you. Average shot lengths have shortened, 
pacing has been cranked up to a breathless sprint, and some films are not watched out of passion or the search for entertainment, but for fear of missing out on an intertextual easter egg for an as yet unreleased movie you might care about. And over time, it's warped audience expectations to such an extent that anything that goes against this formula of familiarity is deemed by some to be antagonistic, incorrect, or heaven forbid, slow. You tired? Yeah. Yeah, you look tired. Now, I like a pleasing slice of spectacular fun as much as anyone. The problem stems from how, in trying to keep audiences engaged and awake, the quick cut, loud noise, sensory overload of modern cinema has resulted in films that don't hit the brakes long enough for viewers to get on board emotionally or intellectually. Just as hardened soldiers sleep through apocalyptic explosions, just as the zoned out prey is pounced on by the predator, Spectacle ceases to engage or impress any sense of urgency once it becomes the status quo. Shit. Which is why watching a movie and seeing this is more enthralling and likely to have me leaning forward from my seat than this. For the sake of dynamics, range and rhythm, we need to see things we don't know or don't know we want. And sometimes we need nothingness. Drip-fed feelings or pin-drop ambience aren't for everyone, in the same way CGI shrapnel isn't for me. I'm not going to piss through your letterbox if you think Olympus Has Fallen is better than the Turin horse. And that's the joyous versatility of this whole medium. Slow cinema can set pulses racing more than skin-deep velocity and sound louder than bombs. Our ability and willingness to decode the fast and slow, overstuffed and skeletally sparse, it can all be as simple as a matter of patience, or as complicated as our cumulative wants and needs for diverting distractions. Whether you're counting seconds with Tarkovsky, or sifting for substance with Ming Liang, there's a whole world of beauty to be found in the boring. Some Terence Malick tranquilizers for our Patreon producers Jennifer C, Claire MD, Becchio, Hales and Rue, Historically Dumb, Scared Confusion, Jake R, and Nicholas Le Revere, and a Jim Jarmusch pajama party for all these amazing folks who support us over on Patreon. What are your favourite pieces of slow cinema or ambient, deliberately paced pieces of film? And conversely, what is it in a film that makes you tune out? Let me know down in the comments, and if you're in a position to do so, consider checking out our Patreon at the link in the description below, where you can sign up to the In From Out Film Club and get your name in the end credits. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, this is In From Out.